What's up? This is David the Real Midwife coming at you live from the basement. As in the basement, yo, I'm a basement dwelling uh, nerd. We are basement dwellers in here. So, uh, today, I want to talk about this is something, this is a topic that I wanted to talk about for a while. By the way, um, it's Holy Week as I'm recording this. So, until Pascha, until after Pascha, I won't upload anything. As per my normal schedule goes, goals. That was a weird way of saying goals. Uh, so yeah, religion and politics. How connected are they? Are they separate? Are they the same? Does politics have power over religion? Does religion have power over politics? Well, I'm gonna start by talking, by going back to, back chronologically. If we observe the rulers of the times, right, BC, 5th century, 6th century, whatnot, we see a common trend that religion is very important. Now, this can be on a societal basis, on a cultural societal basis, but it could also be based on ruler worship. So many societies had ruler worship. Persia had it, as an example. Um, Egypt had it with the pharaohs. Pharaohs were considered as divine. And when we look back today and we analyze those events, what we tend to see, what we tend to understand today is <clears throat> the rulers invoked religion because they wanted power, because they're power-hungry people. They wanted power from the people. And so they used religion as an excuse to do what they wanted to do. So this is a very, I will say... I might be wrong. I might be making a boomer take on this, but this is a very Marxist view of history that there is an eternal battle, dialectical battle, battle between the upper and the lower class. Again, I might be wrong. I'm not a Marx pro, but that's the first thing that I think of. As I said, if I'm wrong, you can tell that to me on comments. If I'm right, you can support my claim. But what I want to focus on, this is a very uniquely secularist view of history is that the purpose of kings is to have power over the people. And it's kind of like a class warfare worldview that we are seeing. But is this true? That's what we're going to look at. Is it really true that religion is just a tool? This is the general idea of people that study comparative religion. And instead of looking at the substance of worldviews, what they instead do is just look at it from the presupposition. This, this is kind of the weird thing it, because... Many of the people <clears throat> that look at the past and look at religion, their worldview is tainting their observation. And many of them don't really want to admit that. So an example of that, someone that believes that religion is a mere tool that looks into history is going to just find examples affirming his own beliefs. This is an example of confirmation bias. Now, this isn't really bad. I don't think this is, a, this is the problem. The problem is that people are not willing to admit this. And this causes a lot of issues. So... From the standpoint of a religious person, at least I try to be, what can what what do we see when we look at history? Well, contrast to the modern secularist paradigm that we live in, what I see is that the rulers understood, and I think the current rulers also understand this, but the rulers of that time understood that religion and politics is very connected. Now, why are they connected in the first place? Well, when we are asking for questions such as meaning of life, morality, ethics, right? All of these important things that we are talking about, you could have a philosophical system justifying them, of course. But ultimately, the easiest and I will say the most consistent way is to invoke religion. Now, is this always successful? No. Um, for example, many Hellenic uh, ideas of religion, deities... It's very chaotic, it's very free flowy, it's not dogmatic enough. And you won't hear that today, like something is bad because it's not dogmatic enough. <laughs> it's, you won't hear that from people. People think dogma is evil and bad when everything is dogmatic. But uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is that it doesn't always work. But the idea, what people understood, the general idea behind it is that that's the only way that I'm going to be able to do what I do. Now... In contrast to today, in today's societies, what we see is this attempt at secularization. Many people think they live in a secular society, but what they've really done 
is that they've changed their deities from let's let's take pagan Greece as an example. They changed their deities from those pagan gods and myths and stories to let's say celebrities, right? This is a very huge thing. Celebrity worship is a very popular thing amongst secular people. Even those that don't like celebrity worship are celebrity worshipers. Sometimes they worship philosophers, sometimes they worship politicians. And what I mean by worship is very important. I don't mean worship in the sense that they sit down their knees and pray, right? They don't they don't do this, but in every other action they do, it is really worship. So taking the part like for example, we see this with we can even say Trump. Uh, we can say this with Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is a deity for many of the leftists. <clears throat> he's a deity, he's a central figure, he's this mythological savior demigod figure for many of the leftists, many of the democratic socialists uh, that replaced their faith with Bernie Sanders. And it's very evident from their actions, from how they adopt his policies, but they never think, they never seem to think why it's morally good why Bernie's policies are morally good, right? They don't try to justify it. They just say, well, you see, it matches up with my politics. That's how most people think today. Something matches up with my politics. Therefore, it's good. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is if we really analyze that, you're not really justifying your position. So let's take a nationalist, for example, right? In, in another case. You can ask a nationalist, why is nationalism good? Well, he's going to answer, well, because we have responsibilities for our people and I'm part of this people group, so I have to defend this people group, so on and so forth. You know, typical talking points. And I will say, I agree, that's good. But what's your justification? Why should I care about my own people? This is the perennial, the why is the perennial question. Because I can invoke that, I can, I can invoke God, for example. And I'll explain that later on why there's some objections that people can make that I will answer. But I can make, well, to me, it's important to preserve my people because, for example, the Bible tells me to, let's say. The Bible tells Israelites to preserve Israel. The Bible really does consider the concept of nations to be legitimate. And so I'm just furthering that legitimacy. That's an argument I, I will make, for example. It's a really basic argument. And then let's take... The other non-religious nationalists argument. Why, why should I care? Well, because if you don't care, you'll have societal problems. Okay. So why should I care about society? Like, why should I care about there being pluralism, for example? Well, if you have pluralism, then you have more crime, right? Your living standards go down. Okay, but why should I care about people's living standards or and not mine? Or why should I even care about my own living standards? And the nationalists kind of, and this can, again, this is nationalist is just an example. This can go to any other groups and they just start thinking, they go, well, you, you are nihilist then. And that's kind of the point is that what I'm asking for is people to justify their positions. And we don't see that today because we live in a secularized world, especially amongst politician, politicians. Why is it that Big, for example, big business. Why, why is it bad that they take money from people? Obviously, I think it's bad, but we have to understand why it is bad in the first place. And ultimately, what I'm hinging at is this, is the existence of morality. Is it true? Is Does morality really exist? Is there really morality? Or is it all subjective? Well, let's take the point of view of someone who says it is subjective. Well, the obvious problem there is, your political views that are supposedly so important are no different from your opinions about music or art. So your view whether rock or jazz is better is virtually indistinguishable from your view on nationalism versus internationalism or socialism versus capitalism. It's no different. It's just, bruh, it's just personal opinion. Come on. Come on, it's just personal opinion, dude. Why are you so... That's ultimately what it re reduces itself to. But people understand that it is serious. And they care about it. And they care about it more than the extent of, well, it affects me personally. No, you'll find very few people who cares about politics because of their own game. You will find these people, but 
you won't find a lot of them. A lot of people care about politics because they really have a commitment to it. Are socialists socialists because they're poor? No, many of the socialists are rich and it will be against, like it will work against them and they're willing to admit that. At least the foot soldiers, right? If you're talking about the elite, that's a different story because they really do have a commitment and that's not a problem. But that means morality, for example, that things really are good and bad, right? There really are things that are good and bad. But the question that we have to ask then is that how do we know what is good and how do we know what is bad? Is it public opinion? Well, that's a fallacy. That's a fallacy. So, right, it can't be cultural and it will even go contrary against what many of people say. If it's cultural, then we kind of have to say that the Nazis were right, right? People have to admit that Nazis were right or, you know, any other genocidal regime is right in everything they did because what they really did is that they were just showing their cultural norms, let's say. So that doesn't make any sense. So it must be some universal immaterial category. Now, you're not going to get that with secularism, are you? You're not going to get that with secularism. You might get that with attempts at Platonism. But does that is that sufficient? You might get that with virtue ethics. But who is this virtuous character that we shall be emulating? I can answer that from a Christian standpoint. It's Jesus Christ. He is my virtue ethics, right? But if for a secularist, who? Is it a creation of your own mind? Is it someone that you made up in your own mind? Or is it concrete? Well, if it's concrete, then who is it? Is it If it's not God, if it's not a deity, let's say my virtue ethics is... Winston Churchill, that's my virtue ethics. Well, try, try to explain to me then how that is not idolatry, <laughs> idolatry, for example. That is make, making a man a god, basically. So that's kind of like what I'm getting at. And what does that have to do with my main thesis? Well, my main thesis, it has to do with this. Whether it is my TV turned on by itself for some reason. Ghosts. Ghosts, I'm telling you. So what I'm telling you, what I'm trying to tell you here is even if a government is secularist by name, it is still religious. It is still theological. Um, it is making use of many theological. So the principle of kings and rulers applying religious principles to themselves is not lost. It's still happening. And so an example of this will be, um, what's an example that will not butcher? So maybe fascism, um, uh, State worship and fascism, maybe. Now, a lot of people might object. Oh, you know, you're making me market. So let me explain myself. Um, first of all, I'm not using fascism as a mere insult. Um, I think people that use it as an insult are, are, shouldn't be taken seriously. It's a real technical political term. But when we speak of fascism, for example, I think what I see when I think of fascism is really religion and state intermixed to together. That the state inevitably, whether the state wants to be or not, I think that is irrelevant to the discussion. It inevitably becomes God. It inevitably becomes the deity that sets the standards because most of the time what we see is whatever is good for the state is good for the people. And this is the main underlying principle behind fascism, which isn't completely false, by the way. Um, but I'm not going to say anything more than that. Otherwise... People can take me down. I, I need to stay silent. But uh, but you're starting to see my point, right? You're starting to see where I'm coming from, where I'm going with this. And history really is just a struggle between how religion and society is trying to be in a unit together. And by the way, I want to say, um, some people say that this is a post-religion state. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. There is no such thing as a post-religious state. There is no such thing as a post-religious world. People have to understand it. Religion is a central and integral part of human society. It's super integral. And if you look at history, we start to understand it. it's super integral. And even if you look today, it is still super integral. Does it have the, is it, is it a different religion? Yes, it is a very radically different religion. 
but it is a religion nonetheless. It's a different form, but it's not it's not something else. And the more people try to think on this, they're start to they they'll start to understand. I think that what I'm saying makes some sense at least. So I want to finalize this video by asking the question, this is for the religious audience, then what should be the relationship between religion and state? Well, if you believe in pluralism, religious freedom, there's two reasons. Number one, you're an apostate if you believe that. Um, you don't take your religion seriously. Number two, you're using this as a survival tactic to make your religion acceptable. So for example, if I live in an Islamic regime and... I want Christianity to be something normal and something socially acceptable. Am I going to be on the same side with religious freedom for that purpose to promulgate my religion? Yes. Am I going to support religious freedom if it's a Christian society? No, I'm going to completely reject that because I don't want people to adopt falsehood. So some people might say, oh, that's, you're being, you're too, you're too crazy. Oh, this is the typical religious people stuff, dude. They just, they just want people, they just want people to have the same beliefs. Yeah, uh, so do you. <laughs> um, religion, like pluralists, of all political pluralists and religious pluralists. This is, this is a very t easy thing to demonstrate. Um, don't you want everyone to be pluralists? If I am anti-pluralist and you're a pluralist, you should support my belief. And you should support it being in the mainstream. If you don't, then you're not a pluralist. Then you are attacking a certain belief. There's a very easy way to demonstrate the hypocrisy of that position. But I'm just being honest with what I believe. Now, what is the relationship? What should be the relationship? Now, we have the papal model and then we have the Protestant model, which is the two sides of the same coin. The pro papal model is that the church is superior to that of the state, right? It, 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 it has power over the state, not only spiritually, but also in terms in terms of politics. Politically, it has superiority. Now, this view, historically, we've seen is a problem. The entire foundation of Protestantism was supported by kings and rulers and princes that rejected this principle, right? So this gives birth to schisms. Now, let me tell you a system that doesn't give birth to schisms over its geopolitical doctrines is Symphonia. Now, I'll get back to Symphonia so, but the other view is that you had on the Protestant side is that the state is its own thing. The religion is its other. And then you have kind of the Anglican view, kind of like religion and state. Most of the time, they're the same thing. Most, not all the time, but most of the time, they're the same thing with the, with the state having some sort of primacy over the religion. We can see that by who's the current head of the Anglican church. It's the queen. First of all, it's a woman that's the head of a church. That's really funny. Uh, <laughs> but it's the queen, right? So it's a ruler that's head of the state. Okay. And I think the best alternative is symphony. And now I think, and this is going to be a Christian argument, I think it resembles in a very hypostatic union, um, the divinity and humanity. So the divinity, uh, I think the church and state are in a union with together where they're still two, but they're also one simultaneously, right? Just like the hypostatic union. So there is some sort of like a union between them, very strong union, where in some sense they are one, where the state adopts an official religion and the, and the, uh, the, and the church is part of that state. Now, of course, it doesn't always have to be dedicated to that specific state. So, for example, when Rome or Alexandria, for example, Alexandria and Antioch were part of Muslim rule, does that mean that Antioch and Alexandria, like, became their own governments? No, of, of course not. Uh, that's not what we're saying here. But what we're saying here is that in terms of political structures, it, Symphonia is the one that makes the most sense. And it's something that we see in the Old Testament. It's something that we see in Christian history. Uh, for 19 centuries, many Orthodox Christian states employed Symphonia. Uh, the Roman Empire did until the 15th century, and the Russian Empire did it until the Communist Revolution in the 20th century. So 20th century is basically, uh, let's say 17th centuries because, or 16, 16 will be better because 
Symphony in the Roman Empire started in the 4th century. So let's say 16, 17 centuries. But that's a very long time in Christian history. We have to understand that. It's a very, very long time. And if you look at ecumenical councils, which are the centerpiece of the Christian faith, all of them were called by emperors. All of them. This shall give any Christian some pause in the relation between church and state. And so if you're a Christian that believes church and state should be separate, I have to wonder what you're talking about because what you're promoting is you're really promoting the church to have its own religion and you're promoting the state to have its own religion. And you also want to serve the state. That's serving two masters. You can't do that. And even if you're not doing it willingly, of course, right? I'm, sep I'm distinguishing bad will, Ill, Ill will from the doctrines themselves. But even if we ignore all of this, Nevertheless, what we see ultimately is that you end up ending up serving two masters. And you can't do that. So you, those two masters have to be in a union, just like it was in the Old Testament, right? So ultimately, religion and politics are very interconnected with each other. Even philosophies, even governments that followed a standard uh, philosophy still deified it, right? Still raised it to the level of dogma and deification. It's not mere human thinking, but they, the way they justify this, it is via deities, right? Pagan deities. And now today, we don't see an explicit mention of deities. We see politicians, figureheads, leaders. This is a phenomenon. This is a very, very new phenomenon. This is not an antique phenomenon. This is a very, very new phenomenon that is only special to the West. Every other society that you see, even today with some of the societies, religion is still understood to be centerpiece. But even in the West today, religion is still the centerpiece. It's just that the religion has become the state and the state has become the religion. And the politicians, rulers, are playing the role of God. And when you look at the, the people that defend democracy, defend pluralism, all you see is just a reenacting of 4th, 5th century Greece, where politicians were understood to be deities alongside gods in an implicit manner rather than an explicit manner. They were the concretization of divinities. They will settle what is right and what is wrong. They will tell you what's wrong. They will tell you, you can't do this. This is against the law. The law is the Bible. The law is the book of Leviticus. And that's what you're going to be obeying. That is what politics has become. And the sooner we understand this, I will say the better. Thank you for listening. Thank you for looking at my ugly face. Um, my 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 facial my <laughs> my facial movements. Um, I'll see you guys after Pascha. I hope you all have a blessed Holy Week uh, amongst this these troublesome times. I hope you have a very good Pascha, and we'll come up with more good quality polemical content in the future. So thank you all for watching this. Um, give me a subscribe. Give me a like. Give me a follow on Twitter. Give me some money on Patreon. Right? What was it? What was that? Is that was it this? Yeah. Give me some money on Patreon, my my fellow goyims in Christ. And um, what else? Give me a subscribe. I guess that's it. Yeah. And if you have like, if you have anything to say, maybe I've missed something. Maybe you want to add something. Make sure to comment it. Right. I, I appreciate you guys's comments unless it's attacking me for a stupid reason. Then I hate it. But if it's something that is constructive, then I like it. So uh, thank you all for watching. I'll see you guys after Pascha in the next video. Goodbye.